Okay, cool, cool. Uh, so, yeah, uh, good evening to everyone here. Uh, so, my name is Meenakshi Sundaram, and, uh, and with Ashwin Amal Raj today, I'll be presenting the first of a series of talks on philosophy in physics, where we'll be giving a basic introduction of the concepts in physics and, uh, you know, the world around us and how uh, this, uh, how philosophy has plays an integral role in science as much uh, as much as we might not recognize it. In the present day, people often think it absurd that, you know, philosophy and uh, science are interconnected. But the truth is they are actually a lot, they're actually a lot more connected than we think they are. So without further ado, uh, before we start, actually, I'd like to um, mention how we got into this. We did a little reading project about philosophy in physics for our uh, college internship. So in this time period, we actually learned a lot and uh, we actually thought it would be a great idea to do a little talk series on this. Uh, and this actually gives us a, you know, I feel like this will enable us to understand science better and view it from a more uh, understanding perspective, like understand how our mind works as we look at science. So uh, I'd also like to thank our guide, uh, Professor V. Murgan, for uh, helping us out uh, with this, uh, with our reading project and uh, he, uh, inspiring us to actually do this talk. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Ashwin. So you can start right now, Ashwin. Thank you. Next slide. Um, uh, so, uh, like Minash said, philosophy is a very huge topic and the definition of the word philosophy itself is uh, very huge. We will just be scratching the iceberg of the philosophy. So, first two topics will be handled by me and the next two will be handled by Minakshi. Next. What is philosophy? From Greek, uh, we know phil means love and uh, from Greek, it literally means to love of wisdom. But is it the word philosophy is not much help here and uh, it does not give us the specific content because nowadays we are using philosophy for literally any field and also defining philosophy is difficult. It's not an easy task. Many great people have tried and many have failed. Yeah, plus uh, asking to define philosophy is like asking somebody randomly to define love. We can't uh, explain it. We, we can just feel it. That's no current definition. Let's see what Google has to say for the definition of philosophy. Uh, uh, Google, uh, in Google it says the study of the fundamental nature of knowledge, reality and existence, especially when considered as an academic discipline. But uh, uh, it, it lacks its core, right? So let's not stick with it. I will take you through what I have learned so that you could come up with your very own definition of the philosophy. So next slide. So what is philosophy? According to historical approach, philosophy is really the study of historical figures who are considered philosophers. Those were famous in their time. So we are going to study their philosophy. Um, the famous names include Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Thales, etc. Uh, the value of historical approach is that uh, it introduces us to great minds of the past. Uh, and uh, the philosophical problems that uh, they have faced, we are getting introduced to that. So the argument of for the historical approach is that no understanding of philosophy can be had unless one understands the past. Without past, it's, uh, we can't understand it. So, next slide. And uh, this method of approaching philosophy, like uh, approaching philosophy through history, has some problems. It restricts the philosophy to an examination of past questions and answers. What we should note here when we are saying past questions and answer is that the questions are uh, very old but still intriguing like uh, questions involving God or uh, why are we alone or similar questions. Uh, it's very old but it's still intriguing and uh, 
when we take this historical approach literally it is really not different from the study of history right uh, if we just imagine it's not very different and this would make philosophy a subunit of history but it's not a subunit of history philosophy is a separately different thing so next one philosophy in a world view uh, early philosophers attempted to discover and uh, describe the world in its simple makeup they said that uh, water is the most important thing in the universe uh, whereas anaximen said that it was here like that many philosophers came up with uh, something like this we may say that the main issue uh, is what concerns the nature of the universe is uh, philosophy in a world view uh, a world view is an attempt to come to a total view of the universe as it relates to the makeup of matter man god politics or science etc and what we should consider here is a element in the cosmos that is important is taken as the world view so next one Uh, and go to the previous slide also if you see this last uh, sentence the fifth point here uh, there is uh, we should not one thing uh, the problem here with the last sentence is that uh, we don't know who or what classifies which is important or not we say that elements in the cosmos that is important is involved in process in world right but we don't know what or who classifies which is important for all we know without uh, some constraints we may say that boy cat person dog box can be taken as most important thing in the universe right so we don't have the constraints to say which is important or not that is the beauty of philosophy so next and this is one of my favorite uh, philosophy uh, marxist philosophy karl marx uh, said that the role of philosophy is not to think about the world but to change it when we say philosophy is a program of change it's it is a program of change it can be compared with uh, any religion like uh, let's take christianity here because it works to change the people to its course or principle so philosophy is to change it. that's what marxist philosophy states so next uh philosophy is the analysis of language when you are saying language it's not uh, seeing the grammar at all it's just say, uh, saying what does the sentence means to us this is one of the most extreme definitions of philosophy uh the analysis of language rejected uh, rejected metaphysics metaphysics is uh, nothing but uh, metaphysics deals with the bigger questions like uh, questioning the reality and all and uh, analysis of language accepts the simple but useful uh, modern standard of scientific verification a central thesis is that only truths of logic and empirically variable statements of meaning hold if we can validate or reproduce something then we can say it is true but if we cannot validate or reproduce something then we have no claim if it's true or not and uh, nothing beyond that don't overthink uh, how to verify that language and the verification work together let's take this example god is love if for it was in chennai and write this song hundreds uh, uh, from here we can see the all sentences are similar and only one is factual and only one can be scientifically verified which is the second sentence hundreds of people go to dig for it on chennai and if anyone doubt they can either visit or check the google map but you cannot scientifically verify rape is wrong and god's law let's just take a imaginary person who was raped or may even witnessed a uh, one but how can we tell whether it's wrong first of all how can we verify or set constraints to the word wrong same applies to the next one for god's law god is not seen and love is not seen scientifically all we know love is just uh, some chemical reaction in print so how can we tell these statements are meaningful 
so only the second one is factual and meaningful uh, if you feel offended by this example i'm sorry i took this cause and explained story strongly so next philosophy is a set of questions and answers from the title itself we can see the meaning uh, question uh, questioning and answering it is how the world works right and so it can be taken as a definition for philosophy philosophy has a long list of topics that has been interested and which are very old which are but still interesting and some uh, up to date uh, topics everything is interesting uh, questions like this are interesting like is man only a body is he have a soul does god exist this type of questions are always interesting many other questions can be also incorporated i'm just telling the only a very few uh, some these three points after first of these last three points are define what is philosophy as a set of questions and answers these three points some questions have several proposed solutions like answering what is the nature of man for this there's no one answer there are several answers and other questions cannot be answered decisively like does god exist uh, or can only be answered this the question can only be answered in terms of probability no possibility what we uh, probability and possibility both are different i just want to quote this from young sir and uh, he tells that uh, there is no probability for the question does for does god exist there's only possibility children tells a example um if the question is said to be probability he may find 1 million in his bed when he go home so how on earth it's a probability it's just possibility we should not confuse the main between possibility and probability here um some questions have been answered to the satisfaction of many philosophers for a long period of time only to be rejected uh, for this let's take two examples the first one is uh, geocentric and heliocentric the uh, geocentric theory is accepted for a very very long time but later it was proved wrong and then heliocentric theory was accepted the, the question had its answer but it was wrong and then the question raised again and then they found a different thing another example is uh, in the old days there is a question in the days of socrates socrates said that man is born with the knowledge known as uh, i think it's innate knowledge uh, innate knowledge for centuries this was accepted by a uh, variety of people but after a very 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 long time uh, john locke a philosopher said no he seems to have different opinion in this matter so he writes this question again and he said that we are not given with innate knowledge but we just gain the knowledge only through experience without experience we can't we don't have an innate knowledge we can only experience thus experience only turns to knowledge so next one Uh, philosophy is criticism from the title itself we can't just simply get the meaning it needs some explanation from the title itself we try to get the meaning uh, it will not be correct so let's just uh, dive into it um the understanding may be reached by looking at one of the philosophers who embodied the definition uh, who is none other than socrates socrates engaged in philosophical criticism for socrates criticism referred to critical thinking involving a dialect in the conversation a dialectic one must keep in mind a running debate with claims counter claims classification corrections and uh, in sincere hope of getting and uh, getting to understand a concept without uh, these things the concept that we get will not be will lack its core value if we want to understand something we have to question it we have we have to question it this type of this can only uh, 
help in the pursuit of knowledge. The, uh, criticism must not be confused with skepticism. Criticism is carried on for the pursuit of knowledge, which is uh, pure and good, and whereas skepticism is not. Sometimes skepticism may be viewed as a, like a stepping stone to knowledge, but skepticism is definitely not a, not for knowledge. Skepticism is always self-serving game, which is not for the pursuit of knowledge. Skepticism always leads to destruction and ends the pursuit of knowledge in uh, in some. So next, next. So we have now seen the historical approach for the definition of philosophy. We have seen the philosophy in its world view. We have seen the philosophy's definition as a program of change. And we have also seen it as an analysis of language. And we have seen it as a set of questions and answers. And lastly, now we have seen it as a criticism. So if you have carefully listened to what uh, we have seen, we may arrive at the conclusion that single definition for philosophy is damn impossible. We can't, there's no single definition for philosophy. But why can't all of this be used for a definition? What we have to understand is philosophy would not be the same without criticism. No philosopher considers an important discussion without resorting to an analysis of language. Some philosophers may reject worldview, but still others seek to understand the whole of the universe. Without historical approach, there is nothing to start from. The historical approach is like the basement of the very tall building. Without it, the building falls, right? Likewise, uh, philosophy is nothing without the historical approach. So, from this, uh, what I think for the observer, the expression for the philosophy is philosophy should be the realism of what we learn for of what we do in our day to day. Philosophy should be like a realism, and it like Marx's philosophy. Philosophy should inspire people to change. This is my version of philosophy. So you guys should also. Uh, construct your very own definition of philosophy from what we have now. So, next one. Divisions of philosophy. Uh, epistemology, metaphysics, logic, axiology, and philosophy. So, uh, let's see what they are. Next. Epistemology. Epistemology is a Greek word and uh, it is translated as the theory of knowledge. Uh, epistemology is a foundational area for other areas of philosophy and this involves three main areas. The source or base to knowledge. How do we know what we claim to know? The nature of knowledge. What do we mean when we say we know something? And lastly, the validity of knowledge. How do I claim to know that something is true or not? I, uh, like I said, the epistemology is the um, foundation stone for all areas of physics, and uh, these three are like the golden rule. So next, logic. Uh, we can just see the heading logic and understand this. Uh, for the sake of giving definition, I put together this. Uh, let's see axiology. Uh, the Greek axios, the Greek word means worth. Here we will be considering two different areas of worth. One is uh, moral worth and aesthetics. Moral worth can also be known as ethics. Uh, we know ethics, right? Uh, in our biology students will always uh, say it is not ethical to cut up mice in half, something like that. Uh, it is the discipline uh, concerning human moral behavior and raises the question whether one, which is uh, whether this action is correct or wrong. And aesthetics concerns with the beauty. So, like says, uh, 
what makes the art beautiful or what makes the math beautiful or something like that. Next. Metaphysics. Metaphysics is another Greek word which refers to the attempt to describe the nature of reality. This is my favorite topic of philosophy. Uh, this involves many questions like the which involves nature and the makeup of the universe and the, whether a man is free or not or being created or uh, is there a creator uh, like this uh, many questions involving the nature of reality is uh, metaphysics and uh, last thing is philosophies of um, because uh, we, from the philosophy is used in many subjects and many disciplines right so they put it as a division itself this involves like uh, philosophies of art philosophy of science philosophy of biology philosophy of religion and our interest of this talk series philosophy of physics uh, so let's see what are the terminologies that we are going to see next some terminology. These are the term uh, terminologies that are related to philosophy of physics, which you will see in the next talk. Uh, inductive and deductive reasoning, just reasoning, and causality is cause and effect. Uh, determinism, scientific realism, instrumentalism. We will see in the upcoming talks. So thanks for listening, and uh, now Meenakshi will continue. Thanks. So thank you, Ashwin. Uh, I will present my slides in a minute. Just give me a minute, I will present. Okay, uh, so I hit a little snag. So yeah, uh, is my screen visible now? Yeah, yeah, sorry about the delay. Yeah, uh, so thank you Ashwin for the talk. Uh, we, uh, now we will look at uh, history of philosophy and philosophy in other branches of science. Uh, so before I start, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, affirm what Ashwin said. Like, like uh, philosophy is uh, like a science that in, uh, makes us think. Uh, regardless of what your approach to it is, it may, the whole idea is to question and find the answers to it. So it's basically question answer, question answer, until you arrive at something that you know makes sense to us uh logically or in terms of realism or whatever approach you take. It should just fulfill like that sense of, uh, you know, the quest for wisdom, if I have to put it in simpler words. So I'll go into the history of philosophy, where we will look at, you know, the works of some uh, great thinkers such as uh, Plato and Aristotle, and of, of course, some other people after him, uh, such as Galileo, Newton. Yeah, so I'll get right into it. The history of philosophy in physics, uh, so, so we'll just limit ourselves to the scope of this, because if I am to explain the history of philosophy itself, uh, I think we'd have to go for an, a whole new talk series for it, because there's a lot of it, 
there's a lot of uh, subject matter in the whole history of philosophy uh, uh, but we look at history of philosophy and physics for now so aristotle and plato's works are like the earliest you know some of the earliest record record in instances of not only philosophy but also physics and also many other branches uh, like you know political science psychology biology ethics uh, economics and so on so it would be better to call them thinkers than just you know uh, philosophers of course you can say that terms are interchangeable but uh, you know they uh, it is because of them that we have so many you know uh, so many uh, so much information about the subjects and uh, a lesser known fact is that as or rather a little known fact is that uh, aristotle was the father of biology and others and he was not only like you know known for philosophy and uh, plato had a lot of ideas about uh, political sciences and ethics and so on and so forth as we look uh, like i said we'll just limit ourselves to you know uh, their contributions to physics uh, and the philosophy behind it and we'll also look into other scientists like galileo and newton and kepler and uh, go into more some more detail in the next few talks then uh, but for now we'll just talk about how how uh, the basics of what they did so we'll get into plato's work uh, plato was born around uh, 428 bc uh, like uh, somewhere or uh, and he was socrates student actually so socrates taught plato and plato uh, taught aristotle it's like you know a chain of knowledge right there quite valuable knowledge uh, but uh, Plato was someone who like founded the academy, the Platonic Academy, and it was like the first Western university. Uh, while Socrates was considered one of the founding fathers of Western philosophical thought, Plato made it you know uh, more widespread by by his academy, and uh, he wrote a lot of you know philosophical texts, like as you can see, twenty five texts, and the they weren't like small you know. Uh, text they were like quite extensive and he talked a lot about you know uh, the philosophy behind physics psychology ethics and a lot of it so uh, it's, a, it's a plethora of subjects that he dealt with uh, he dedicated a lot of his life to learning and teaching uh, other people and yeah like I said uh, along with Socrates and Aristotle he's considered one of the founding fathers of uh, western philosophy so he stressed the importance of science and mathematics and because of this he was known as a maker of mathematicians. Now, one notable point, which uh, I mean, I, I'd like to say it right now, but uh, it would be a little out of the scope of our talk. But regardless, uh, Plato was an instrumentalist, basically meaning that he treated science and mathematics as objects to explain uh, objects and explain stuff, explain uh, what's around us. Uh, so we'll look at what he did. Some of his famous works, uh, one is Republic, and it's a wise society. It, it put for, puts forth the idea of a wise city run by a philosopher. And then there was a lot of famous dialogues that he had early, middle, late, and that that is like a metaphysical theory. It, those were treatises, treatises in metaphysics, you could say. And that's that's like something that uh, was well uh, that is well known for because it actually laid the foundations for you know what is metaphysics today. And yeah. Uh, He's one of history's most uh, influential philosophers. Got to give credit where it's due. Uh, there's like a lot of uh, philosophical subfields he dealt with. Ethics is, of course, a question of philosophy and cosmology and uh, metaphysics. Metaphysics, again, is a qu uh, question of philosophy, but you might ask me how cosmology comes in here. As for that, uh, we will take a look at it in the next talks, but uh, there is always like a philosophical approach uh, to, uh, to it. It, it is never possible to, you know, have a complete, e even though uh, uh, Plato was someone who relied uh, on instrumentalism, there had to be some thought behind it. So there was some philosophy behind it. Uh, and uh, just because you're philosophical doesn't mean that, uh, just because you're instrumental doesn't mean that you're philosophical, you, you aren't philosophical. So you could you could look at uh, Plato or you know any uh, Greek philosopher or you know any pioneer of Western thought for the matter back in the day and think hey this guy wasn't a scientist uh, you can't even call him a scientist by modern standards but what they contributed back then is quite valuable and it's quite important that I don't think that we'd have any of it right now if it wasn't for their their you know work that actually enable people to think. Uh, like it's a it's a chain of knowledge like i said it's just passed on from generations and 
it, it is upheld and it, it, it is constantly evolving. It, it, uh, it has potential to evolve even further. Uh, so that is science and that is philosophy even. Uh, in metaphysics, Plato envisioned the systemic rational treatment of forms and interrelations. So there's like good one, uh, the one, the good, uh, and all these, uh, he, he separated them into like uh, forms and how they were uh, connected and stuff. So ethics and moral psychology, he developed a view that good life requires not only a certain kind of knowledge. Socrates, his uh, teacher had suggested that, but a habituation to healthy emotional responses and therefore harmony between three parts of the soul. According to Plato, there was reason, spirit and appetite. Of course, we know, you know, three, uh, three parts of the soul. You could think about moral psychology and three parts of the soul. You could say id, ego and super ego, but, and these are radically different from what we see right here. But regardless, you see how he approached that thought. And uh, how, you know, um, how a lot of this uh, was like a little bit of a foundation for behavioral psychology and stuff. So there were also uh, discussions where he uh, talked about aesthetics, political philosophy, theology, cosmology, epistemology, and the philosophy of language. So it fostered research and not only in philosophy, but also a number of other fields, mainly scientific and uh, mathematical. Now it would be called mathematical scientific, but back in the day, everything was, you know, uh, quite, uh, quite mixed up. I would say people often really didn't know where, where to like put the line, but now we of course know better. And like I keep, uh, I can't stress the importance of these people because if not for them, we would have never, you know, be we would i i think we'd never be where we are today so next we will look at aristotle's work so aristotle was born in 384 bc and again uh he was he was one of the uh, great thinkers and he, his works dealt a lot with uh, a variety of subjects so and he was a staunch believer in scientific realism Re uh, i'll just give you a, a little bit of an introduction to realism although i said that we will look at instrumentalism and realism in the next talk uh, realism is where you just don't read what whatever you're looking at as mere objects and think it explains more than the, it should pertain to the world around you rather than just explaining it like an object. It should fit the principles of what's around you. Uh, basically, it should fit. You could say it should uh, adhere to reality. So Aristotle had a set of beliefs which were accepted by a significant portion of the people of that time, and it was even um, accepted up to 1600 CE when you know science radically started to change after the work of galileo and then much later newton but you know uh, up to 1600s uh, common era we we strongly held aristotle's work as you know the only you know credible source of you know uh, the the scientific uh, sci the sci the basic principles of science so we'll call this the aristotelian worldview or aristotle's beliefs so, like we said, like Ashwin said, the worldview is supposed to explain how we see the world around us and how we question it and how we arrive at it. So, the, uh, the Aristotelian worldview. Before we go into this, I would like to point out very well that some of these, while we read it out loud, it might seem quite ridiculous and, uh, you know, laugh worthy. But, uh, uh, like, uh, again, like I said, these, these are important. I think these are important and they, like, any, and if not for these uh, beliefs, I don't think we'd ever question them and uh, try to arrive at, you know, a consensus or rather a theory that was, that would be widely accepted and then prove it. So, and, uh, and uh, I also forgot to mention that Aristotle is, is, is like one of the reasons why we have like the scientific method. So the first, uh, we look at a set of beliefs, uh, the first of the Aristot Aristotelian worldviews. So the earth is located in the center of the universe, a geocentric theory, of course, uh, which is later disproved as we'll see. The earth is stationary and it neither orbits uh, any other body such as the sun nor spins on its axis. It seems absurd, but uh, let's look further. The moon, the planets and the sun revolve around the earth, completing a revolution about every 24 hours. Seems to make sense, but you know, how, how would it evolve faster? These weren't questions that were asked. And for whatever, you know, scope of the subject and knowledge we had at the time based on observations, this is all we could, uh, this is all Aristotle could conclude. So in the sublunar region, the region between the earth and the moon, that, that included the earth itself. There are four basic elements. These elements are earth, water, air, and fire. The four elements, uh, 
and the objects in the superlunar region, that is a region beyond the moon, and that includes the moon, sun, planets, stars. And they are composed of a fifth element, ether. Uh, ether is better, is also known as the fifth element, and you know, uh, people also considered the existence of ether up to the time of the Michelson Morley experiment, which actually, you know, was a foundation for special relativity. Uh, ether, uh, you might ask me what ether is, and I would say in simpler terms, it could be regarded as, you know, atmosphere or whatever is around us. The definition of ether changed. In this, it's a little different. It's what the, you know, uh, it's what, uh, according to Aristotle back in the day, was the sun and planets and stars were made up of. Each of the basic elements has an essential nature, and this essential nature is the reason why the element behaves as it does. Okay, this seems a little rational, uh, because, you know, uh, the, uh, how we arrived at the existence of elements and how they all have their own properties and uh, other, th other things. So, the element behaves as it does. It seems like a log logical explanation, and you could say that this was actually a little bit of a foundation for uh, some principles of, of us investigating chemistry, alchemy, and then later chemistry. Uh, the essential nature of each of these basic elements is reflected in the way that element tends to move. Okay, so this again is like uh, how the uh, how the nature reflects the uh, how the element tends to move based on these uh, you know based on this nature. But of course, when I say elements right here, I don't mean you know uh, carbon or nitrogen or oxygen or other such elements or even organ. We're talking about the elements. Uh, the five elements basically air earth air earth water fire and uh, ether so the element earth has a natural tendency to move toward the center of the universe that's why the rocks fall straight down since the center of the earth is the center of the universe okay looking at this you can say that this is the first notion of gravity and uh, we uh, we assume that the earth was at the center of the universe like you know uh, or rather aristotle assumed that the earth was at the center of the universe so he, uh, the rocks fall straight down and they just they just held together by the center of the universe this also you know kind of uh, explains uh, uh, how the others behave in a different way which we look at how the other elements behave, behave in a different way which we look at the element water also has a natural tendency to move towards the center of the universe but its tendency is not as strong as that of the earth element. That is why when we when dirt and water are mixed, both tend to move downward, but water will eventually end up above the dirt. See, it seems a little fair, but you know, uh, based on whatever knowledge we had, I think this seems like a little bit of a rational explanation. Uh, the element air naturally moves toward a region where that is above earth and water, but below fire. That is why air, when blown into water, bubbles up through the water. Again, uh, how these elements are connected is what we are trying to arrive at, is what Aristotle was trying to arrive at. We could even say, refer to us as a species who will try to find this. The element fire has a natural tendency to move from the center of the universe. That's why fire burns upward through the air. It moves along with air, basically. The element ether, which composes of objects such as the planets and stars, has a natural tendency toward perfectly circular movement. That's why planets and stars continuously move about circles, move in circles about the Earth, that is, about the center of the universe. Not only was this, you know, later disproved, as we'll see, but also, you know, they don't revolve in circles, as Kepler pointed out. So, in the sublunar region, an object in motion will naturally tend to come to a halt, either because the elements composing it have reached their natural space in the universe, or far more often because something, for example, the surface of the Earth prevents them from continuing toward their natural place. So, an object will naturally tend, tend to come to a halt. I guess is, you could say this is the first notion of inertia, uh, but, you know, the explanation behind it seems a little wonky, and it doesn't, it doesn't sit well with our standards of science today. Uh, but anyway, let's just go on. An object that is stationary will remain stationary unless there's a source of motion in a self-motion as when an object moves toward its natural place in the universe or an external source of motion as when I push my pen across the desk. That's a good example. Again, these two seem to explain Newton's uh, first law, but Newton's first law is little more, you know, uh, little more, obviously, little more advanced because we, are, we understood the world better. Uh, now we understand the world better now, and even a few years, a few hundred years ago, we understood it a lot better than we understood it in Aristotle's time. So therefore, uh, we could say that these were like 
uh, so, uh, some of these, some of these 14 postulates as we see right here explained uh, a lot of things and actually enabled us to think more. While it seems absurd right now, if not for these, I don't think we'd ever thought further and investigated the subject further, drawn conclusions that this is wrong and that this is right and so on and so forth. So we look at post Aristotle, a uh, little, uh, a long uh, time after Aristotle, I, I, I guess you could say like almost uh, more than more than 800 years even, uh, more than 1,800 years, but uh, sorry, uh, I don't know, it's somewhere around 800 to 1,000 years. So, uh, we will look at, uh, Copernicus. So, so he proposed the first known heliocentric theory where he proposed the earth rotated on its axis and when turned the sun in a circular path modified by epicycles at a, a uniform speed. Galileo is called the father of modern science and he studied speed and velocity, gravity and free fall, principle of relativity, inertia, projectile motion, which, and all these greatly, you know, uh, you know, motivated Newton's work I, because Galileo was like the first, uh, uh, you know, first one who took, took a lot of, you know, he's the, uh, he's the father of modern physics, modern science, modern physics, father of observational astronomy. There's a lot of, uh, things he's, you know, he's considered the founding father of. And, uh, of course we know about Galileo's infamous, uh, struggle with the church and, uh, how his fear is destroyed. And you might ask me why, um, Copernicus. Who presented his theory later and Galileo had only further worked upon uh, Copernicus's theories. Why wasn't uh, Copernicus subjected to what Galileo was? That's a little bit out of the scope of this talk. We look at it in the next talk. It's it's quite an interesting story and you know has a lot of irony in it. But regardless, let's let's go on. So here next we'll have a Newtonian worldview. I have put this in separate slides instead of you know uh, uh, talking about it in like small paragraphs like Copernicus and Galileo. Because the Newtonian worldview radically changed, it was, it was like a radical departure from Aristotelian worldviews. It comes post 1600 common era. So this is like a completely different perspective and it, and it seems to sit well with our uh, standards. Although of course, uh, Newton's, Newton's theory did seem to crumble when you took uh, Einstein's general theory, uh, theory of relativity and its explanation of gravity into account, but you know, this is still being taught and it's like one of the basic principles that we look at in science. We don't, uh, in the present day, we don't usually take up a science book and start reading about Aristotle immediately. We rather look at Newton and uh, Galileo and Copernicus because post Aristotelian, Aristotelian uh, you know, science and philosophy, and philosophy and physics is definitely a radical departure from what Aristotle had done. So we, we, as we can see right here, the earth revolves on its axis and completes the revolution approximately every 24 hours. This is well. Uh, so the first one was something we can agree with and something that's been, you know, proven over time. And the earth and the planets move in elliptical orbits around the sun. Uh, this is a little bit of Kepler in, uh, Kepler's ideas that came into this, but I don't mention Kepler here because, uh, his work is a little, uh, goes a little more into, uh, the topics of a second talk. So we'll be looking at that later. So say that for later. And uh, the whole idea of elliptical orbits was presented by Kepler and therefore Newton just incorporated a little bit of Galileo and Kepler into his theories in, in, rather than his worldview. So there's slightly more than hundred basic elements in the universe. Uh, we departed from just labeling earth, air, water, and fire as for, you know, uh, an ether as the only five elements that exist in the earth. Now we found hundred, like 24 literally. So, uh, but he said that there's slightly more than hundred basic elements. Again, uh, this is proved. Now we have like 180 elements, uh, all of which, uh, we have lanthanum series, you have, uh, so on and so forth, actinum series, so on and so forth. Uh, all, all the, some of these, are, uh, you know, uh, uh, not, not exactly, uh, synthesized, uh, naturally, regardless, these elements can be formed through a process. So there are 118 elements and this is true. Objects behave as they do largely because of influence of external forces. For example, gravity, which is why rocks fall. Yeah. Uh, as I said earlier, new Einstein just proved that gravity was seemingly an illusion based on general relativity. But of course we won't go too deep into that and rather just stick to Newton's worldview for now. Uh, 
objects such as planets and stars are composed of the same basic elements as objects on Earth. This again sits well uh, because the formation of the universe, I think it could only be explained by uh, how you know the basic elements. Hydrogen is found in stars, and then uh, helium gas. That further, you know, further atoms and proton. Uh, sorry, atoms are formed by uh, electrons, protons, and neutrons building up from these elements. And then we have, you know, more elements such as carbon, silicon, nitrogen, oxygen, so on and so forth. Uh, the, and these were just ejected by stars when, you know, they exploded or uh, and they were deposited. And these formed uh, further more uh, further more planets and uh, from these elements from carbon mostly. So if someone says we are nothing but stardust, it actually that's what it actually means. So this this again uh, this. This again is like a little predecessor to the theory that I uh, just said right now, where um, we are all made of, uh, where, where everything was made by uh, hydrogen and helium where, from stars, and then those further combined to make more basic elements, and that, that just synthesized further, and we, have, we are where we are right now. The same laws that describe the behavior of objects on Earth, for example, uh, for example, that an object in motion tends to remain in motion, also apply to objects such as planets and stars. This seems to explain his rationale behind uh, the universal law of gravitation, how it works. Uh, because how these, how the laws that are on Earth are universally applied to even other objects, that's a form of extrapolation, which we'll get into more detail in the next talk. Uh, before you uh, you ask me, why I say that this will all be covered in the next talk? Because uh, those subjects, like Ashwin said in his previous uh, in the previous slides. Uh, where we talk about uh, uh, concepts such as uh, causality, determinism, uh, reason, uh, reason, inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning, these things will better explain uh, how this, uh, how these laws, how these worldviews were arrived at rather. So next we look at uh, philosophy in uh, other branches of science. We look at philosophy in mathematics. Before I, we go further, I'd like to point out this is not too deep and we'll just be looking at it in a superficial sense. Next, we'll be looking at uh, philosophy in theology. Uh, but before I get to that, I'll finish uh, philosophy in mathematics. Mathematics is regarded as a science. Then the philosophy of mathematics can be regarded as a branch of philosophy of science, of course. Uh, next to disciplines of uh, philosophy of physics and philosophy of biology. Every uh, branch of science has its own approach because it deals with different subject matter. Although mathematics and physics are uh, interlinked, it has its own philosophy because of the subject matter math deals with. Uh, unlike the natural sciences, because like I said earlier, uh, unlike the natural sciences that investigate entities looking in space and time, it's not obvious that this this uh, mathematics is also the case of objects. Uh, this is also the case of objects that are studied in mathematics. So uh, yeah, uh, as we can see. The theories of natural sciences appear to be less certain and more open to revision than mathematical theories. Mathematical theories are more, you know, uh, they, they're more rigid and, I, and you can't really sway them as such. Because uh, if you look at it, uh, if you look at it in a way, mathematics is quite uh, uh, s s simple science uh, when you look at it in the beginning. But as we go further, it does get difficult, of course. But uh, it's all a matter of understanding. And once you mathematically grasp a concept, I, I don't think you can, personally, I don't think like you can change it as such or you can propose change to it because it is like a language of logic in a way. But uh, more about that later because uh, you can't always, because there's some people who said it didn't just, it's not just limited to logic, it also explains the world around us, which we look at later. So for these reasons, mathematics poses problems of quite distinctive kind for philosophy. So philosophers have accorded special attention to ontological and epistemological questions, which we look at now. There are a lot of schools of thought in mathematics, but uh, we look at four main ones: formalism. So we, are, unlike institu intuitionists, we look at intuitionism later. This theory did not take natural numbers to be mental constructions. Instead, it was argued that the natural numbers are taken to be symbols. Symbols are strictly speaking abstract objects. Nonetheless, it is essential to symbols that they can be embodied by con concrete objects, so that we may call them quasi-concrete objects. So the uh, so this is like a theory that's based on uh, re realism. 
I would say, uh, it's like anti anti realism. It's more of an instrumentalist approach. Uh, uh, like I mentioned earlier, instrumentalism and realism. These terms might seem a little new to you. Some of you might even know it, but um, uh, we'll get into more detail about these terms later. Uh, just just the basic definition where instrumentalism treats uh, what we what we deal with as mere instruments, but realism deals with it as more of sitting together with reality. So Platonism. This is an example of Platonism. Is a good example of realism. Realism. Realism, realism approach to mathematics. So mathematical ent entities are abstracts. Uh, as you can see, it contradicts formalism. Again, this is a different school of thought. This is often claimed to be the most, you know, uh, uh, view most people have of numbers because, uh, like, they believe it exp uh, explains the world around us and uh, uh, puts it together uh, rather than treating mathematics as a mere uh, you know, a tool that expresses the world around us. It is actually the world around us, and it's and it's a form of studying. Uh, but however, as we can as we can see, these theories, you know, they were later, you know, uh, debated. Like the, uh, there were a lot of anti-Platonists who came up later. A lot of anti-Platonic uh, math, Platonist mathematicians who came up later. So uh, we uh, we can see that uh, they have no spatial, temporal, or causal properties. And they are eternal and unchanging. So the term Platonism is used because the view seen parallel to Plato's theory of forms and the world of ideas described in Plato's allegory of the cave. Every everyday world can be only imperfectly approximate and unchanging un, un, ultimate reality. Yeah, but the seemingly ironically it seems to you know uh, uh, completely shun Plato's uh, view of uh, you know uh, instrumentalism. But of course it seems to. The, again, uh, we will look at how uh, instrumentalism and realism, as much as they are different, can be you know together in so, at some point uh, at some in some cases, not in all cases, but in some. So we we'll look at logicism again, uh, more of a instrumentalist approach. It attempts to reduce mathematics to a language of logic, like I said earlier. Uh, mathematics is like a language of knowledge. Uh, sorry, uh, language of logic. But uh, not everyone shares this view. So logic is supposed to be neutral about matters that are ontological, and this seemed to uh, go along with the anti-Platonistic atmosphere of the time. Uh, there were people who are against the whole idea of mathematics being reality itself. So logicism was like a good example of this, uh, uh, of a good example of a school of thought for this. Intuitionism, like like we looked at in the first uh, formalism. This treats mathematics as abstract concepts like mental constructions and uh, proofs and theorems are again mental constructions. It just reduces this to mere, you know, mental constructions. And uh, it ra and if you if you ask me personally, I think it rather reduces the whole uh, meaning of mathematics as a science. It, it just seems to trivialize it in a way. But uh, uh, again, these were some approaches that were uh, apparently said to be made by the Ideal mathematician abstraction is made from contingent physical limitations of the real life mathematician. So we look at some other schools of thought in mathematics where we have mathematicism, conventionalism, constructivism, finitism, predicativism, and structuralism. Again, uh, these schools of thought are like the, the sub schools of thought of whatever we have seen. The first four schools we've seen, these come under uh, the, these uh, six concepts come under those actually. So uh, we'll first look at. Uh, Mathematicism. Not only do mathematical objects exist, but nothing else does. Uh, nothing else does. So this again is like a projection of the whole uh, Platonist Platonist concept. And uh, next we look at conventionalism. Uh, Henry Poincaré was the first to share a conventionalist view. So he uh, considered non-Euclidean geometry for his work in differential equations and. They seemed uh, correct, and uh, they uh, they seemed logic uh, they seemed logically and you know based on rational rationally correct. So uh, uh, he he was convinced that you can't really take the axioms of geometry to be uh, chosen for the results they produce. It doesn't, uh, and uh, it should it should be sitting with the coherence of human intuition in the physical world. So next we look at constructivism, and this is pretty much like intuitionism. Constructivism involves the regulative principle that not only mathematical entities, which can be 
explicitly con constructed in a sense, certain sense should be admitted to mathematical discourse. In this view, mathematics is an exercise of human intuition. Again, this is like a small uh, sub sub school of uh, intuitionism. So, constructive is uh, next. We look at uh, fi finitism. Finitism is like an ex extreme form of uh, constructivism, and uh, it reduces the whole. Uh, it, it says there is no n number of numbers, and uh, like the the name is pretty self-explanatory. It reduces that mathematical object does not exist un unless it can be constructed from natural numbers in a finite number of steps. So you can't have like infinite number of steps where you just keep adding one and one and one and one to arrive at infinity. So there's like a school of thought, which is very extreme in terms of constructivism, which didn't seem to, you know, uh, say, and, it, and this is again an example of a mathematical realist theory. So we, we have uh, predicativism. This is again, ultra finitism. It takes, it takes it to another step where uh, acceptance of objects in mathematics no one can construct these in practice because of physical restrictions of constructing large in finite mathematical objects. This really, really even reduces the whole concept of finitism, which again reduces the whole concept of institutionalism, which seems to, uh, you know, uh, reduce more concepts of uh, the whole concept of math itself. Personally, this is what I feel, but of course, these approaches can uh, differ. So, uh, uh, so with all due respect, uh, these are all like, you know, different approaches and why some, why we not, might not agree with them. They sit well with some, uh, approaches in mathematics and don't sit well with some other approaches in mathematics that is left to you to decide as to whether these sit well with you and you can adopt any approach at the end. So structuralism is a position that holds ma mathematical th theories, describe structures and that mathematical objects are exhaustively defined it defined by their places in such structures, consequently having no intrinsic properties. So um, this is more of a instrumentalist approach, an anti-realist approach even, uh, sits well with logicism and, uh, you know, other anti-realist schools of thought. So that concludes uh, schools of thought in mathematics and uh, basically philosophy in mathematics. Of course, it's a lot more extensive than what I explained, like I said, it's superficial, but I felt like uh, since mathematics is, uh, you know, tied to physics and it actually helps us express physics in terms of, you know, in a language we can, uh, that can be put into, you know, understandable terms. I felt like this would be a good topic to look at, but any of you are free to look further into this. So we look at philosophy and theology. You might ask me now, why are we looking at uh, theology, which does, which is, you, it's fine if you talk, spoke about mathematics, you can, yeah. I can understand you talking about mathematics, but why theology? Uh, theology, I think this thing seems to explain a little bit about how humans, uh, how we as a species, the human species, have a little bit of a flawed approach to this. Uh, that's why I chose to talk about this. The relationship of theology to philosophy is very difficult to determine, and it's a lot more complicated. If one understands philosophy as the discipline that attempts to explicate the totality of the being, the difference between philosophy and theology becomes more uh, apparent. If theology is responsible to an authority that initiates his thinking, speaking and witnessing, a document containing revealed truth as well as spiritual testimony related to it, philosophy bases its arguments on the ground of timeless evidence, an evidence with which autonomous reason understands itself to be confronted. That is basically uh, the idea of determinism, which we'll look at in the next talk. This is like a deterministic approach and rather not the whole idea of determinism itself, but it seems to be kind of grounded in it. Since on the other hand, theology uses reason and systematically develops its tenets. However, much critical reflections are based on religious convictions. There are many common areas that have partly complementary significance, but that partly also led to bitter tensions. Therefore, uh, philosophical theology varies greatly from national theology. Uh, as uh, Mortimer J. Adler, uh, great, uh, a great uh, philosopher and uh, theologist, said, uh, uh, according, uh, uh, it might be uh, worked by someone with religious uh, convictions or a religious bias even. Uh, uh, national theology might be worked on, upon by someone with a religious bias and, uh, or a religious conviction. The former takes a more objective and a factually based approach to the subject. Mortimer J. Adler took this in the form of uh, took this in the form of a little bit of an ad hominem, where um, he went that the theology done by non-Christian philosophers is uh, you know philosophical theology, and the ones done by Christians are like national theology. 
the national theology is just seems like a misnomer and it's like apologetic in a way because uh, it, it uh, uh, natural theology uh, while being done by Christians to explain their own cons uh, concepts might uh, differ from philosophical theology which is done by uh, you know uh, someone of a, let's say of a pay, pay, uh, someone a follower of paganism who explain who tries to uh, find who tries to study theology and you know some concepts that are based on Christianity in it. Uh, he, uh, Mortimer J. Adler thought that uh, you know a religion, uh, one's religious uh, belief or religious conviction definitely had an influence on the approach to the philosophy in it, or the, uh, rather the whole approach to theology itself. Some philosophers, of course, have disagreed with this, but uh, it it is understandable to see as to how some one's uh, religious you know orientation could lead to someone not uh, you know for uh, someone not being really objective in their work. This again is like steps, stems from a flaw of you know, humans to rather explain what they want to than to, you know, uh, accept the fact that we can, you know, make errors in determining something, make errors in thinking something, and we should be more open-minded in our social science. Uh, so, you know, uh, that I think that's the reason I thought about talking about theology, because I feel like uh, whether uh, whatever philosophical approach we take, we should always have like an open mind and uh, uh, be be ready to be proven wrong, be ready to be questioned, because that's where the essence of science, uh, science and even philosophy lives. So I conclude the first series that uh, me and Ashwin conclude the first series of talks with this, uh, and thank you. You may ask any questions if you have any.